Um, I've been asked to to connect two sets of dots here. Um, one set is are the dots introduced by Buffy and Bea, and another set are the dots between the Adolescent Development and Juvenile Justice Network um, and the the Law and Neuroscience Network, um, because some of the work that we're doing in the new network builds on work that the old network uh, uh, did. Um, so I, w I want to do a few things. First, tell you a little bit about what the old network did that's relevant to this topic. Um, revisit some of the issues that Buffy raised about the use of neuroscience in the Supreme Court decisions um, in involving uh, juvenile punishment. Um, talk about why neuroscience may or may not be important to this discussion, um, and then tell you a little bit about uh, what, what I think we need to be doing and how one of the studies of, of the network that Owen directs um, is going to address part um, of that. Um, and and I, let me start with, with something just to think about that I think is going to occur across the, the two days of this. And it was the question that was raised at the end of the first presentation today, um, which is if we can identify this individual as a psychopath by giving him validated paper and pencil tests, um, why do we need to scan his brain um, at all? And I think in, in the same way, if that is, it, it, I think it's very fair to ask, uh, if everyone knows, that is, as any parent knows, um, that adolescents are different than adults, um, why do we need brain science to persuade courts that they ought to be treated uh, in a different way um, than adults? I don't have good answers for those questions, and they're questions that I've been struggling with for the last 15 years, and my um, opinion about them changes on a daily basis. Um, so... The, um, the Adolescent uh, uh, Development and Juvenile Justice Network, funded by the MacArthur Foundation, um, did uh, its work between 1997 and 2007. And, and the purpose of the network was to look at research on adolescent development, uh, behavioral research, psychological research, and ask how the findings from that work um, in, should inform legal policy and practice. Now, to put this in historical context, um, the, the work that Bea uh, uh, presented to you showing our understanding of the development um, of brain and changes in brain anatomy and function over time didn't start to appear systematically um, in the literature until the late 1990s. In fact, the first longitudinal study of this was published in 1999, I think. So, uh, so our, net, our network preceded th this interest in adolescent brain development um, in, and w which was a reason why, from the beginning, we never even thought about looking at adolescent brain structure or function and connecting that to legal policy and practice. That was kind of an afterthought that came about because of um, the interest in the field. I would go around and give talks to groups like this, not as eminent as groups like this, but, but to groups um, of legal practitioners, and they would hold up the cover of Time magazine and say, well, what about the adolescent brain? And my talk was usually about adolescent behavior. Um, so we began to think that maybe we ought to be talking a little bit about that as well. The main study that our network did that's relevant to today's topic was a study of age differences in the capabilities and capacities that are relevant to judgments of criminal responsibility um, and culpability. Um, and what we did, in, in, in a nutshell, we did a study in five different sites around the United States of over 900 individuals where we tested their um, impulse control, their susceptibility to peer influence, um, their sensation seeking, and, and so forth. And um, the main findings of that study that are important um, were um, precisely what Bea was talking about when she talked about the brain function and, and structure, which is that, that various measures of people's inclinations to engage in sensation seeking, novelty seeking, and risk taking all increase from late childhood into middle adolescence reach a peak somewhere around 16 or 17, um, depending upon the measure you use, and then start to decline. So think of that inverted U-shaped um, curve that Bea had up um, uh, in her slides. Um, at, at the same time, what we found was that on our measures of impulse control and um, uh, uh, resistance to peer influence, th things that involve what we call top-down control um, that, that are um, subserved by prefrontal functioning and by the c 
by systems that involve connections between the prefrontal cortex and other parts of the brain, that those aspects of behavior um, all increased and improved linearly over time from late childhood into um, mid, the, the mid-20s. And so what, what a n number of us began suggesting was that we should think of adolescence as a time of kind of maturational imbalance. That is, that is the, the metaphor that we began to use was that the, um, you know, the, the engines are activated before there's a skilled driver behind the wheel or before there's a good braking system um, in place. And that metaphor, I think, has guided a lot of discussion um, about how we ought to treat adolescence um, under the law. Now, if you look at um, the Supreme Court cases, not only the ones that uh, Buffy mentioned, but if you look at Thompson versus Oklahoma, which was the 1988 case um, in which the death penalty was outlawed for people under the age of 16, um, that, that, that the language that the court uses to describe the differences between um, adolescents um, and adults becomes more neuroscience-y you know, with, with each case. So in Thompson, the, the justice's rationale for banning the juvenile death penalty for people under 16 was kind of, uh, in, in fact, th they just simply referred to common decency. A and, and if you read the opinion, it's sort of like everybody knows that kids are different from adults and we ought to treat them differently and it doesn't make sense. It's offensive to think about sentencing somebody to death who's this young. When you get to Roper, as Buffy mentioned, in the amicus briefs that were submitted to the court and a little bit in oral argument, adolescent brain development was mentioned, but it didn't, it wasn't at all referenced in the court's opinion. Um, and in Justice Kennedy's famous line, you know, as any parent knows, um, and as, si as as scientific and sociological studies tend to um, confirm, adolescents are different from adults. Um, when you get to Graham, which is uh, five years after Roper, um, you see in the opinion um, reference to the fact that since Roper, there has been more research in developmental psychology and in brain science um, that shows that there are differences between um, adolescents and adults. Um, in, and, and in that opinion, specifically pointed to aspects of executive, uh, uh, aspects of behavior control. That was sort of as sophisticated as the court was in its discussion of neuroscience there. By the time you get to Miller, which is just two years after Graham, um, neuroscience is sort of front and center um, in, the, in the oral arguments and in the opinion, in which they not only reference the, the brain or brain science, but they, they talk about what you learned about this morning, brain regions and systems. I mean, that phrase appears in the Supreme Court's ruling um, in, in which they talk about um, the, the, the systems that are related to higher order executive functions. So, so by the time you get to Miller, you know, this, this now is firmly entrenched in the vocabulary and thinking um, of the court. Um, we don't know, of course, what impact neuroscience had on the justices' decisions because we don't know what they talk about when they're in their um, deliberations, but it seems to me, given this uh, a cursory analysis of their opinions, that it became more and more um, important. And, and I should say that, uh, although our discussion has focused a lot on these Supreme Court decisions, um, that I get calls every week um, from um, typically defense counsel uh, asking to prepare a report or serve as an expert or testify um, in cases where there's an adolescent defendant and where the prosecution is seeking um, a, a very harsh penalty or transfer to the adult system or whatever. Just this morning, um, I've received an email from an attorney in New Jersey who's representing a 17-year-old straight-A student already admitted to Duke, um, but who was just... Uh, uh, killed somebody um, uh, in a driving uh, accident, and there was some alcohol uh, in his blood, and the prosecution wants to uh, uh, try him as an adult. And this defense attorney said, can you come and explain to the judge what we know about the adolescent brain and how that's relevant to my client's case? So, and, and I also get calls in civil cases um, as well, where an adolescent does something foolish, um, one case involved a ski resort that had a very, very challenging area where it was very easy to injure oneself. And it was labeled as, this is a challenging area where it's really easy to injure yourself. <laughs> okay? 
But some 14-year-olds decided that they were up to the challenge, and one of them had a terrible accident, and the family wanted to sue the ski resort for saying, look, a sign like that is not going to keep a 14-year-old um, away. What do we know about adolescent brain development and how that might affect their judgment and decision-making in a situation like this? So it's not just um, in, in criminal court, and it's not just at the, highest, at the highest levels. I heard this last week about a 12-year-old who was she herself driving the carpool for her friends to school. Yeah, not a good <laughs> idea. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I think, um, I, I think, and, and, I, and I agree with, with um, both Buffy and Bea, that I, I think the neuroscience can serve two purposes in this discussion. Um, one of them is that uh, it, it, it can help support the argument that adolescents behave differently um, uh, than adults for reasons that they don't have control over. In other words, um, it's not simply differences in their preferences um, and attitudes. That, that is, if we come back to something Bea said, uh, that they, if they have the apparatus to make adult-like decisions um, at the age of 16 or so, why don't they make them? And then the question is, are they, do they not make them because they choose not to make them? Um, and could, or do they not make them because there's something um, about their biology that gets in the way of making them? So I think that's one place in which neuroscience has been um, useful. The other, where I think it could be useful, but we don't know enough yet about it, is on the question of amenability um, to treatment and, and potential for rehabilitation. There is this idea out there um, that the brain is more plastic during adolescence than it is during adulthood. I don't know of any studies that indicate that that's the case. I don't know of any studies that indicate that it's not the case. Um, but a lot of people believe it to be the case. And so I think that um, neuroscience could be helpful if, in fact, we were able to demonstrate that there was um, a sort of neural evidence uh, supporting this idea of greater plasticity. So that then leads me to um, what, I think we, what I think we need and, and how the new network is trying to address at least one of these needs. So the first need um, is research that measures um, the, the brain, uh, uh, age differences in brain function and brain structure and age differences in legally relevant behaviors in the same sample of people. All right. Um, and so one of the reasons that the driving study Bea uh, showed you has gotten such attention is that everybody gets the idea of what it means to take chances um, when you're in a driving game and the light turns yellow when you go through the intersection. Um, anyway, we designed the task to, uh, to, to mimic a real-world situation. Um, but but um, until very recently, those tasks weren't being used in studies of age differences in brain structure and function. And as I said, the MacArthur study um, that we did in the original network had no brain measurement at all. So one thing we need is more research that connects the two, because the arguments that have been made in the, in the brief submitted to the court are kind of argument by parallel trajectory. In other words, th what the briefs say is, look, we know that people become better at controlling their impulses as they move from adolescence into adulthood. And we also know that there's synaptic pruning in their prefrontal cortex as they move from adolescence into adulthood. And we also know that the prefrontal cortex is very important for things like impulse control. So therefore, it seems very likely that these things are causing um, each other. Of course, we don't know what the causal direction is, um, and, um, uh, uh, and, and we, need, we need to understand that better. Um, a, a, a second area um, that, I, that I mentioned where I think research would be very helpful would be to directly study brain plasticity um, at different ages to see if um, the brain is, in fact, more plastic um, during adolescence than, than, than during adulthood. My, my, uh, I, I'm not uh, uh, very, um, very well schooled in this area of science. My understanding is that there have been um, gains in our, in our in the way that we think about and measure plasticity um, in the brain, and perhaps this can be done um, in a developmental study. And then finally, um, and, and Buffy mentioned this, is the question of neural predictors of individual behavior, either recidivism or amenability to rehabilitation. Um, and I agree uh, with Buffy that we are nowhere near there yet, despite the fact that some people will tell you that we are um, that we are there. I think it'll be quite some time before 
um, we have a, a research base that will allow courts to look at uh, brain scans and make decisions about sentencing um, on, on the basis of their um, uh, uh, prediction of future behavior. So let me just very quickly say that in the, in the new network, um, what we're doing in a study that's led by B.J. Casey, who's a developmental neuroscientist um, at Cornell Medical School, is we are doing a cross-sectional study of individuals between the ages of 10 and 24 in which we are capturing the brain imaging um, and the performance on the sorts of real-world tasks that have been used in disparate studies and putting them together in the same sample. A second thing we're doing in that study, which goes to a, a very important point that Bea made, is that we are looking at age differences in performance on these tasks with and without manipulations of the emotional and social environment. Because what we know is that if you put adolescents in a situation where they're by themselves and they're not particularly aroused, and you're measuring what psychologists call cold cognition, they do just as well as adults do. But as you saw in the driving uh, slide that Bea put up, and other studies have, have confirmed this as well, if you give them the exact same tasks under conditions when they're with other people or when they're emotionally aroused, they don't perform as well as adults. Um, and since most juvenile crime occurs when kids are with other people and are emotionally aroused, the studies of cold cognition might not tell us what we really need to know about how we ought to treat adolescents differently from adults. So we have built into the design of the new network study um, these social and emotional manipulations as well.